Hello, um, I'm Dr. Laura Fredo. Welcome to another New York Gastroenterology Associates webinar. Tonight, we have a great talk with Dr. Jim George. He will be going over inflammatory bowel disease. What do I need to know? So basically a practical lecture on inflammatory bowel disease, IBT. Um, so just some housekeeping issues before we get started. Um, he will talk for about 30, 40 minutes, and then I'll be collecting all your great questions as he goes along. So make sure to submit questions in the chat and question area. Um, try to focus on questions that are more general. We can't really focus on individual patient questions right now. Um, that's something to directly discuss with us in the office, um, but we'd be happy to answer as much as we can tonight. Um, this will be recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, um, <clears throat> definitely check out the recording on the website um, late in a few days, it'll be posted there. And we have a bunch of other great webinars. We've been trying to do at least once a month since this lovely pandemic has started um, on all different topics from COVID to um, IBS to general gastro issues. So definitely check those out. Um, so just a quick intro for Dr. George. Thanks for spending time with us tonight. Um, he is an IBD expert. So how did he get to that title? Um, basically he had dedicated 27 years of his career, um, where he sees about 75% of his patients are patients with IBD. So along that way, you know, he did his medical school at Albert Einstein in the city. Um, he went to the West Coast to UCSF for his residency in internal medicine and then came back to Mount Sinai where he did his fellowship. And he really started to get his IBD interest by training with the greats of the field, you know, Henry Janowitz, Dan Present, and David Sacker. Um, and along the way, he's lectured all across the country. He's written numerous articles about IBD. And now even, with New York Gastroenterology Associates, we're all being involved in clinical research. So um, great expert in the field, great guy to chat with. He's going to um, shed some light on the topic and um, it will be great to chat after his talk. Okay, so take it away, please. Uh, thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, my name is Jim George. I know uh, a lot of my patients came on to the webinar. And uh, obviously, I don't see anybody, but welcome. Um, so I just want to give a, a, a brief, well, maybe not so brief, overview of inflammatory bowel disease, but I want to keep it general. I want everybody uh, on this webinar to walk away feeling comfortable with understanding what inflammatory bowel disease is, what it means to have inflammatory bowel disease, uh, not to be scared about it, um, and to have an idea of what our general concepts are about how physicians approach inflammatory bowel disease and how we treat inflammatory bowel disease. In my opinion, the more knowledgeable you are, the patients are, about what we're doing and some of the things that we do are uncomfortable and, and uh, disconcerting, but there's a reason we do these things. And as long as you can understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and what the approach is, um, it'll make uh, your relationship with the physician much more comfortable. It'll, it'll empower you to understand what we're doing and it'll give you a lot more comfort instead of fear going forward. So um, I am not gonna be talking about specific therapy of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, because that's a whole different talk. It's more about approach and follow-up. Um, so basically, uh, we're going to talk about the impact of IBD, what we believe the causes are, what the features of IBD are, some of the different ways we diagnose inflammatory bowel disease, and our approach uh, to treatment. Um, so what is inflammatory bowel disease? So just so that you know, your body uh, needs to protect itself from outside uh, environmental pathogens. So your skin protects you, your lungs protect you, your GI tract uh, protects you because you're always um, being exposed to foreign uh, 
things that your body may or may not recognize. So there's always some immune uh, inflammatory condition going on in your intestine because you're always being exposed to pathogens from the outside world. So inflammatory bowel disease is a condition where there's overactive inflammation in your intestine that shouldn't be there. Some people use the word autoimmune, but it's not really autoimmune because that actually has a different meaning. It's, it's immune dysfunction. And the two major forms of inflammatory bowel disease are Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease means nothing. It's somebody's name. And ulcerative colitis, which makes sense because it's chronic inflammation in your colon. Uh, Crohn's disease is the name given to a condition where there can be inflammation anywhere in your intestine from your mouth all the way down to your anus. And Dr. Burl Crohn uh, wrote the... Uh, preeminent article describing Crohn's disease many, many years ago. So inflammatory bowel disease is not irritable bowel syndrome. It is not a functional bowel disease. There is actually structural damage in inflammatory bowel disease, and there is not structural damage in irritable bowel syndrome. So when somebody comes in and I try to explain inflammatory bowel disease, I just tell them their immune system is overactive. And the best analogy I have is psoriasis. So you can imagine if you had psoriasis, you would see this rash on your skin. Well, imagine that rash, that redness, those cuts, those scratches are now inside your intestine. And depending where they are in your intestine, the degree of inflammation, is it severe, is it mild? And the, the length or how much of the bowel is involved, that will give you symptoms. And there are many, many patients living with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, probably between two and three million people in the United States currently have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease is increasing over time. So you may know friends, neighbors, relatives, all of whom have inflammatory bowel disease. And anytime you have a chronic condition like inflammatory bowel disease, it, it not only affects you as a patient, but it affects your family, it affects your parents, it affects your siblings, it affects your loved ones, your spouses, it affects your children, it affects the people that you work with. So it, it affects more than just you in general, but it does have an effect on all the people around you. So when we're treating inflammatory bowel disease, we really have to take a generalized approach to everything and how it affects your life, not just the condition itself, and how it affects you outside of just your medical condition. So everybody says to me, Dr. George, why do I have inflammatory bowel disease? And the short answer is, unfortunately, we don't know. We don't know the cause. It's not so simple. It's not like an infection where you might have strep throat and we know it's a bacteria and the bacteria is strep and we give you an antibiotic and, and, the, and the strep is gone. And it's not as of yet a curable condition. Again, we, we don't know the cause. We know it's a condition, it's a chronic condition that you have. And the belief is that there are some genetic susceptibilities. So you have a certain gene pool that makes you susceptible, that you're exposed to some environmental triggers and whether that trigger is an infection, whether that trigger is stress, whether that trigger is the, the chemicals uh, in our food, the fertilizer, the antibiotics, um, and that interacts, interacts with your host immune response, which also includes your microbiome. And, and, and something gets triggered. And instead of having a low level, normal, low grade inflammation, which is protecting you, it becomes over inflamed. That's a simple, simple way of putting it, but it becomes dysregulated and the immune system can't turn off. And when that hit happens, it triggers inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, the, the impact of inflammatory bowel disease, obviously financially, is, is going up. We have a lot of new therapies. Besides having inflammatory bowel disease, we have these expensive therapies. So the cost of treating IBD has gone up over time. Um, and the impact has gone in over time. So when we see people who we think have inflammatory bowel disease, um, 
we have to initially make the diagnosis. So somebody will come into the office and we'll determine whether or not we think they do or don't have inflammatory bowel disease. And again, we break it down for lack of a better term to Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis is a little more simple to understand because the inflammation is only in the colon or the large intestine. It tends to typically begin at the very end of the colon called the rectum, and then the inflammation then progresses backwards. So if you have inflammation in your colon, you tend to get diarrhea, cramps, bleeding, something we call urgency, which means you have to run to the bathroom. Um, and depending on how much of your colon is inflamed uh, and, and the severity of inflammation, that will determine your symptoms, whether they're mild symptoms or more severe symptoms. Crohn's disease can affect anywhere in the intestine, but typically affects the small intestine in an area called the ileum, which is the very end of your colon, and or the large intestine or the colon, and it can affect it to varying degrees. Some patients with Crohn's disease have it limited to the large intestine, and we call that Crohn's disease of the colon or Crohn's colitis. So inflammation in the colon is colitis, and the type of inflammation, inflammation is called Crohn's disease. And believe it or not, sometimes we cannot tell whether you have Crohn's disease of the colon or the large intestine or ulcerative colitis because it can be indistinguishable and it can be really hard to tell the difference. Um, so we do different tests to diagnose inflammatory bowel disease. And unfortunately, sometimes one test is not enough. So we do a history, we examine you, we do a family history, and then we do uh, a bunch of different tests. And when we see somebody who we think might have inflammatory bowel disease or inflammation in their intestine, there are other causes of inflammation in the intestine which are not inflammatory bowel disease. There's infections, which is the most common cause of inflammation in the colon. You go out, you have a bad hamburger, and you have some infection, and you get inflammation in your colon, and that's called an infectious colitis. Sometimes you can have a low blood flow. That's called ischemic colitis. Sometimes you can take medications that cause inflammation in your colon. Sometimes you can get radiation for, you know, a different type of cancer like prostate or ovarian cancer, and you can get inflammation called radiation-induced inflammation. You can have, I have a patient who may or may not be on the video who had endometriosis of the bowel. She didn't have inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, very rarely cancers can almost mimic inflammatory bowel disease. Irritable bowel syndrome is the most common cause of GI symptoms that we see, which cause cramps and diarrhea. But in irritable bowel syndrome, there is no inflammation. There is no psoriasis or scratches in the intestine. So that's a functional bowel syndrome, but a lot of the symptoms are similar. Uh, sometimes you can have severe diverticular disease or diverticulosis that can mimic inflammatory bowel disease. So we have to do a number of tests to figure out sometimes what it is. And sometimes the condition can be hard to diagnose. So after the exam, we do a bunch of blood work and our blood work looks for inflammation. It looks for anemia. It looks for uh, malnutrition or loss of protein or albumin. One of the tests that we do very commonly and I do is something called a stool test for a calprotectin. Calprotectin is a protein that white blood cells make in the stool. You shouldn't have that much calprotectin in your stool because you should not have an abundance of inflammation. So if your calprotectin is high in your stool, it is very suggestive that you have inflammation in your intestine as the cause of your symptoms, as opposed to irritable bowel syndrome, which is just, well, that's a whole separate discussion, but can cause a lot of different symptoms, which can mimic inflammatory bowel disease. But in functional bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome, your calprotectin should be normal. And one of the things that we do, when, when, when I do, when I'm monitoring patients with inflammatory bowel disease, is I get a calprotectin at the beginning 
to see how bad their inflammation is. It just gives me a kind of ballpark figure. And then a calprotectin after I'm treating them to make sure their inflammation is getting better. We do uncomfortable procedures. We do things called endoscopies and colonoscopies. We actually go in with thin, flexible tubes, and we look at the lining of the intestine, and we take biopsies. And this helps us determine the extent of inflammation. In other words, how much of the bowel is inflamed and the severity of inflammation, because not only does that tell us what's going on, but it also gives us a prognosis. It lets us know if you are more likely to have a milder case of inflammatory bowel disease or a more severe case of inflammatory bowel disease. After we do these tests, sometimes we have you get x-rays, and these x-rays are called CAT scans or MRIs, and they help us determine if there's inflammation further inside where our scopes cannot reach because our scopes only have a certain length. Your colon is about five feet long, but your small intestine is about another 14 feet. And we can't always get in there with our scopes. Sometimes we have you do a test called a capsule endoscopy, which is a pill can. You swallow a pill, a pill, and it's, it uh, attaches these pictures to a recording device that you wear. And then we sit down and look at the images and it takes pictures of your entire small intestine to see if we're missing something further inside that we can't see with our other tests. So how do we distinguish between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? So ulcerative colitis involves the colon and the bottom of the colon called the, called the rectum is typically always involved. So the inflammation typically begins in the rectum. After you receive therapy for ulcerative colitis, your rectum may not be as inflamed, but at the beginning, the bottom of the colon is inflamed. And ulcerative colitis, by our teaching, only involves the surface of the colon. It doesn't typically go through the wall of the colon. So it's a more superficial inflammation, and it tends to be continuous. It tends to start in the rectum and go back a certain amount of inches or feet, depending on how much of the colon is involved. And many times also if colitis starts all of a sudden, okay? Crohn's disease, like I said before, can involve anywhere from the mouth to the anus. And the colon is involved in 40 to 50% of the patients, but the rectum can be involved in about 10% of the patients, which means it can be hard to distinguish between Crohn's disease of the colon and also the colitis. In Crohn's disease, the inflammation tends, can be more severe and tends to go through the wall of the colon, and it leads to potentially other complications, such as narrowing over time, because the colon gets, or the intestine can get thickened and scarred. It can form tracts that we call fistulas, which is when the inflammation or the ulceration goes through the wall of the intestine and can spread to other organs or other pieces of the intestine. And one of the complications that we see in Crohn's disease, but not ulcerative colitis, is abscesses or fistulas around the anus. And what does that mean? But what does that mean, fistulas and abscesses around the anus? It means an infection that is right near your anus because Crohn's disease can affect the glands that are right around the anus and you can get a pimple that grows into an abscess and that needs to be drained. And sometimes that bursts and that causes an infection in the area. And that infection can sometimes be chronic and lead to something called a fistula, which is drainage of the skin over there. And that can happen in as much as 20 to 25% of patients with Crohn's disease, but not typically or not with ulcerative colitis. Crohn's disease tends to involve different parts of the intestine where you might have one part that's inflamed and another part that's not inflamed. And again, Crohn's disease involves the small intestine in over 50% of cases, whereas ulcerative colitis does not. And Crohn's disease can be hard to diagnose. Ulcerative colitis is, is a little bit easier to diagnose because you start with diarrhea and bleeding typically. But if Crohn's disease is way inside your small intestine, you might not even feel it. You might have a little gas, you might have a little bloating. Younger kids or pediatric patients might not have any symptoms or might just have fever. Or they might just have what we call failure to thrive where they just don't grow. 
They're not growing like their peers and they might not have any other symptoms. So the diagnosis of Crohn's disease can elude, elude us as physicians and as parents at the beginning because the symptoms might not make any sense. So it's, it can be a little bit more tricky to diagnose. And the issue with Crohn's disease is it tends to, the onset tends to be in younger age individuals. So the onset of Crohn's disease tends to be in your teens and 20s, but we see people with onset of Crohn's disease, pediatric patients, you know, two, three, four, five, eight, ten. 10. So it can start earlier. And there is a second wave of Crohn's disease that tends to start later in life. But, you know, where we might see somebody in their 60s or 70s develop Crohn's disease. But for the most part, and again, this is just the most part, it tends to start at a younger age. Uh, so, again, ulcerative colitis involves the colon, you have bleeding, you have multiple bowel movements, loose bowel movements, you have to run to the bathroom, you can have a lot of discomfort. The more severe the ulcerative colitis, you can have weight loss, fever, pain, depending how severe your colitis is. But those symptoms come from the large intestine or colon, and this is just a picture. Your colon should not look like this. It should not be rough and red and sore with that little white exudate. If you've ever scraped your knee and looked at your knee, you see this white stuff on it. Those are the white blood cells that are causing inflammation or that are attacking the colon. That's what that white stuff is on the left. And that's just a biopsy. I won't quiz you on that. Um, we use these different scores to de determine how severe the inflammation is. But this is more used for study protocol. So when we have somebody who we put in an ulcerative colitis study, we say they have a score, a Mayo score. And, and people have Mayo scores from zero to three. Zero is normal, three is very bad. And we want to give you medicine and we want to get that three to a one or a zero. So these scores are used more for um, study purposes. Again, Crohn's disease is very different. We believe that there's a preclinical onset of Crohn's where you don't feel it. <clears throat> and then eventually, looking at this graph, you get a diagnosis. But Crohn's disease can be funny. You can have periods of time where you feel good and periods of time where you don't feel good. And sometimes you're not even on treatment. You go, good, not so good, good, not so good. And it doesn't make any sense. But over time, this inflammation that you may or may not feel, if untreated, this inflammation in various parts of your intestine can cause a narrowing because you can imagine if I was taking acid and dropping it on your hand, dropping it, dropping, dropping it on your hand, initially it would be red and sore. And then you develop an ulceration. And then over time you develop a callus and you'd get thick, thick skin. Well, that happens in your colon and the colon or, or the small intestine, excuse me, anywhere in the intestine, and the pipe where the intestine gets narrower and narrower. And whether you're feeling it or not, there is damage to the intestine that causes it to get narrow. Sometimes the narrowing can lead to a blockage or what we call an obstruction. Sometimes you can, your, your intestine gets so narrow, it forms other tracts and connects other parts of the intestine. And those are called fistula. Sometimes an ulceration in your intestine can go through the wall of the intestine and involve your bladder or involve another part of your intestine. So even if you're feeling it or not feeling it, we believe ongoing inflammation in some people can potentially cause damage and scarring, and we need to treat that whether you feel it or don't in some patients. And I will caution my patients Sometimes they always think, well, maybe it was something I ate, or I went to a holistic doctor and they gave me this thing and I felt better. I'm not saying that you didn't feel better, but just realize that 30% of people in double blind studies who get placebo get better without treatment. And that has to do with the natural history of Crohn's where it ebbs and flows. And there's not always constant sensation that you're feeling bad. So just be very careful when when you have inf inflammation and you see all these people who are trying to hopefully do good and treat you, they, they don't necessarily have the knowledge and the expertise that we have where we're constantly monitoring you to make sure that inflammation goes away. And the other caution I give you is 
your inflammatory bowel disease is not your friends, your cousins, your neighbor's IBD. So just because they're on something and they're doing something, it doesn't mean that something is right for you. Everybody has good intentions and some people don't. And everybody wants to kind of help you, but just you should go over these things with your physician who's taking care of you. Um, so we talk about Crohn's disease in a way different than ulcer, ulcerative colitis. We call it, we, we tend to call it whether you have inflammatory Crohn's disease, which is pain, fever, diarrhea, weight loss, or what we call stricturing Crohn's disease, which is when you get blockages. So that can be different in different patients. And again, like I said before, if it goes through the wall of the intestine, you can get an abscess with something called the fistula. And these are the phenotypes. This is like how doctors characterize it. So if I'm talking to another doctor, I might say they have inflammatory bowel disease of the ileum or stricturing, stricturing disease of the, of the duodenum. And, and, and we talk about this amongst ourselves. But again, your case is your individual case. And this is a, a, a colonoscopy on somebody with Crohn's disease. And on the left is a normal colon. But on the right, again, you see these ulcerations. And they're deeper than what we see in ulcerative colitis, okay? And this one happens to be in somebody's ileum or small intestine. And again, this is the pictures that we look at when we're doing our endoscopies and colonoscopies. And I see a lot of patients and they say, Dr. George, why are you asking me these questions uh, uh, about, do I have sores in my mouth? Do I have a funny rash? Do I have back pain? Do I have joint pain? Do I have pink eye? Uh, uh, um, and the reason I ask them is because a certain percentage of patients with Crohn's disease or also colitis, this inflammation can be outside of the intestine and cause a variety of symptoms. And sometimes patients will come to me and say, you know, I've had this rash and I go, oh, you have inflammatory bowel disease. They'll say, well, how did you know? And I said, well, that's the rash that we see with patients sometimes with inflammatory bowel disease. So a lot of my patients know when they have symptoms that sound funny, they call us because I need to make sure it's not a manifestation of their inflammatory bowel disease that's causing these symptoms. Um, so <clears throat> again, I don't wanna go over specific therapy. I just wanna go over the approach to therapy. The approach to therapy is to make you better without making you worse. Sounds simple. So it, we all have the same goal. The goal of therapy is to make you function completely normally, like you don't have inflammatory bowel disease. And do that so that I'm not giving you a side effect of whatever treatment I'm giving you. And it can be very scary sometimes because we're talking about medications that, that if you read on the internet, if you ask friends, they might tell you, oh my God, this medicine has all these side effects. Did you see Google? Did you see, you know, did you ask your cousin? And the answer is some medicines do have potential side effects and we do monitor you. But having inflammatory bowel disease, which is uncontrolled and not treated appropriately can cause more potential damage to you than the potential that you might have a side effect from a medication. So our goal of therapy is to make you better. And one of the things that's not included in this talk, and I apologize for that, is that our medications work best when given early. So in other words, if I was to light a match, my patients know this, I, they hear this all the time, I was to light a match and light my desk on fire, I could take this bottle of water and put the fire out if I do it within the first minute. But if I was to walk out of my office and do a bunch of other things and come back an hour later, this desk would be on fire and this bottle of water would have no effect, okay? So in inflammatory bowel disease, especially Crohn's disease, the earlier we treat you with medication that causes mucosal healing, which means it gets rid of the inflammation completely. The earlier we treat you, 
the more likely you will respond. You have a much higher response rate to medication if I treat you within the first two years of diagnosis. And you have a much more likelihood of leading an absolutely normal life if I treat you early than if we wait until you have complications because it's much harder once you have complications because sometimes the bowel damage is not easily reversed. Okay, so I need to figure out how much disease activity you have, how severe it is, do you have any complications? Have you tried other drugs before? And do you have any other problems that have nothing to do with your inflammatory bowel disease? Do you have another infection? Do you have any comorbid conditions? Are you elderly? Do you have lung disease? Do you have heart disease? Are you pregnant, right? All the pregnant people come in, right? And I have to take those things into consideration before I treat them. So in the past, we used to just say to the patient, how do you feel? And they told us better or worse, no good. That's no good. Now we need to not only ask you how you feel, we have to make sure you're better. So we do non-invasive markers of inflammation like blood tests, CRP, sed ring. And we measure, I measure fecal calprotectin. I don't wanna know that you just feel better. I need to make sure you are better because I want to prevent the inflammation from causing damage to your bowel. Okay, so how do we know if somebody's gonna have severe inflammatory bowel disease or not severe inflammatory bowel disease? Well, if you're diagnosed early, earlier in life and you also have colitis, if you have a lot of inflammation throughout your entire colon, if I do a colonoscopy and you have severe inflammation, if you require steroids, if you require hospitalization, if your protein counts are low, that's more likely you're gonna have severe ulcerative colitis. What about Crohn's disease? If you're diagnosed before age 30, which unfortunately is most patients, if you have a lot of bowel involved, that's more likely to have uh, complicated inflammatory bowel disease. If you have rectal disease and Crohn's disease, if you have deep ulcerations, if you have those abscesses or fistulas around your anus, if you've had prior surgery, if you have fistulas, meaning they penetrate through the bowel, so what do I do with my patients? I say to them, especially the asymptomatic patient, a patient that doesn't feel so bad. I say, okay, how much inflammation do you have? Is it three inches? Is it five feet? Is it a place where if five to eight to 10 years down the line, you need an operation, is it gonna be a small resection? You know, five or six inches? Or is it gonna be four or five feet? Is it an area that we can operate on? Is it, if I operate on you in that area, will you need a bag? So those things all come into consideration. And if the answer is, I have a tiny little area of Crohn's, it doesn't bother me that much, I feel pretty good later in life, maybe you don't need strong medication. Maybe you don't need a biologic agent. But if you have risk factors for uh, 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 a more aggressive disease, those patients, we have to be more proactive in treating and more proactive in following you and making sure you get better and making sure you, your inflammation heals. So what do we do? We want to get rid of the inflammation so that you feel better. We want to normalize your labs. If you're a child, we want you to grow we don't want to give you side effects of medicine, especially steroids, which have long side effects over time. And then most importantly, we want to change the natural course of your disease. We want to make your disease go into remission so that you stay in remission. And then we monitor the therapy. And my patients say, Dr. George, how long do I have to be on the therapy? And I tell them, if I have you on a safe, effective medication, that's not altering your quality of life, that's allowing you to live normally, that's allowing you to raise a family, that's allowing you to have children, we're gonna keep it going for now because I don't have a cure yet. But if I can get you on a medicine that's safe and effective, that makes you live normally, then let's keep that going because there's a lot of evidence that if I need something strong to make you better, if I stop it, more likely it'll come back. Okay.
Mucosal healing is important. It's important because it decreases the likelihood of a flare and it decreases hospitalization and complications. These are the medicines that we used to use in the past for inflammatory bowel disease and we use sometimes. Uh, mesalamine, steroids in different forms, budesonide, which is a non-absorbable steroid, or prednisone, which is an absorbable steroid. They all have potential side effects. They all have some role in therapy. And we do use them to treat our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And now we have all these other medicines that I'm not going to go over. But these are medicines that you hear about and that you see, and they all have their potential benefit and drawbacks. And for patients who have more extensive inflammatory bowel disease, we tend to use these medicines more frequently and monitoring. Um, one of the things that we also do when we monitor a patient is we get levels of medication. In other words, not only do I want to make sure you're better, I want to keep you better. So we monitor the amount of these biologics in your bloodstream to monitor your response to therapy and to keep you better. So these other tests that we use, these ancillary tests are very important in monitoring your response and monitoring when you might not feel better. And we might make you do these tests, but we explain to you why we're doing it. Um, surgery is another treatment option in inflammatory bowel disease. I tell patients it's not a failure necessarily because sometimes it's the best treatment for that patient in particular. And I'm not going to go over all the different surgeries. I'm just going to say that some patients need surgery to get back to having a good quality of life. And then after surgery, sometimes we put you on medicine, especially in Crohn's disease, to prevent the inflammation from coming back. Okay, so I know I'm at about 40 minutes, and I'm just going to talk about one other subject. Patients say to me, what can I do for my inflammatory bowel disease that's not medicine? Or what can I do to prevent my children who potentially might get inflammatory bowel disease because I have inflammatory bowel disease? And we don't have all the data. We don't have all the answers. But what I tell my patients is this. A lot of it is common sense. It's just common sense. You want to live a healthy lifestyle. You want to exercise. You want to eat right. You want to avoid large amounts of sugar. You want to avoid large amounts of processed food. You want to, you want to avoid large amounts of animal fat. If you want to do a diet, a special diet, there are diets that people do with inflammatory bowel disease. There are diets that cut out sugars. There are diets that cut out processed foods. There are diets that cut out animal fats. There are several different diets that people choose. And I encourage them because some patients do feel better on these diets. And some patients, their inflammation does improve on these diets, okay? Especially with Crohn's, not as much as also colitis. But you need to be monitored and the inflammation must go away, okay? You should avoid excess amounts of alcohol because you can imagine if you have ulcerations in your intestine and you're drinking alcohol, it's not good for the intestine. You should avoid excess amounts of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, Motrin, Advil, Leaf, because those things cause inflammation in your bowel, okay? Um, you should get plenty of sleep. You should get plenty of rest, okay? Because rest is very important because you can't, you need rest for your body to recover. And then the most impossible thing, and if somebody figures it out, stress, stress is bad. Stress is bad for everything. Stress is bad for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so those things are things you can do, and you could talk to your doctor about specific other things that you might be interested in. Be very careful about the alternative doctor that says, I have the cure for you. I'm going to give you this potion. I'm going to give you this meditation. I'm going to give you this acupuncture. I'm going to give you this whatever. Because let me tell you something. 
We've been doing the studies. We do double-blind placebo-controlled studies. We make sure our patients have mucosal healing. We need to not only say you feel better, because many people feel better when they do things, but we need to make sure you are better when you're doing something. And, I'm, and we, we do those things. A lot of these other people don't do those things. They're not monitoring you. And then the patient comes to me after you know, four months of alternative therapy and they've got an abscess or a fistula or they need an operation or something that may have been avoided. Okay, I'm gonna stop there because I'm over my time limit and I'm gonna open this up for questions. And I'm back. Here we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a lot of information, a very easy to understand um, manner. It was great. Um, your fans are um, admiring and appreciating everything you've done for them. So uh, during this talk and then as their doctor. Um, so we got, had some great questions come in. Um, some generalized ones, which you touched on as they were asking them, you were answering them, which was perfect. Um, one real basic question that someone asked, which I think is important to go over is talking about a flare. What's happening when someone has a flare? You hear about flare ups and how do you know, is it just from their IBD or is it something else <coughs> going on? What, what, tell us a little bit about that. So, so we have patients who we get into remission, meaning that they feel fine with inflammatory bowel disease. And then all of a sudden they start to have symptoms which may or may not be secondary to their inflammatory bowel disease. Sometimes it's simple. Sometimes a patient might say to me, look, Dr. George, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to have some mucus and blood in the stool and they have ulcerative colitis and, and it's a typical, over, over time, my patients and I get to know each other and we know what a typical flare is for them. It means their symptoms are coming back and the inflammation is back. Okay, that's what a flare is. And we, we, we try to control those symptoms, but sometimes it, it might not be their inflammatory bowel disease. It might be an infection. It might be a medication that they're taking that's giving them symptoms where they might have inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. So why not? Uh, millions of people have an inflammatory bowel disease and millions of people have irritable bowel syndrome. You can certainly have both. So exactly. yeah. sometimes so we, have, right, we have to do tests. Yep, exactly. So we might do blood tests. We might do that fecal calprotectin, which I like to as my go-to test, which measures is my pain and symptoms coming in from inflammation. But even if we see inflammation, we already said inflammation can be from an infection, right? It could be salmonella. So we might need to do different tests uh, to determine if your flare is from your inflammatory bowel disease. And if it is from your inflammatory bowel disease, then we have to decide why the therapy I'm giving you is, isn't helping anymore and, and what we can do to uh, treat it and how we might be able to prevent that flare from happening again in the future. Good question. They're all good questions. There's, there's so many great questions. Um, let's see, quick question. What about probiotics with IBD? Okay, so the best probiotic in the world is eating healthy. There is no better probiotic, I don't care what they say, than eating healthy, which means plant-based vegetables, which have long fibrous chains that give you good bacteria. Some people eat these long fibrous chains and get gas and bloating. That's a separate <laughs> issue. But the problem with probiotics is probiotics doesn't mean anything. There's 5 million different probiotics on the market. All are encapsulated differently. All have different bacterial strains in them. All are and, and everybody's microbiome is different. So why is one probiotic good for one, every single person? If that were the case, it would be so simple. Exactly. Yeah. Um, eat healthy. Eat healthy. Feed your healthy gut bacteria. That's what you got to do. And, and try not to take antibiotics unless you absolutely Yeah, have try to, to avoid that's antibiotics. A, yes. That's a huge avoid one. Um, I tell all my patients, if they get sick, don't run to the doctor if it's just a cold. Just honey, the grandma was right. Honey, tea, and lemon. <laughs> and a warm washcloth on your head or something. <laughs> and call us because we want to know. We, we will help you get through whatever's going on. We'd rather know 
you know, what's going on so we can help you decide what to do. Um, some more great questions. Let's see. Um, people are, we kind of talked on diet. Um, you know, if someone is having symptoms, should they be eating a specific way? Not necessarily to treat their Crohn's because we know we need to decrease the inflammation from their, their immune system dysregulation. Everybody but. feels better when they eat less. And so, um, so, so for better or worse, eating less, especially with Crohn's disease makes you feel better. And, and again, it kind of goes back to what grandma said, you know, soup and crackers and light things. If you have what's called an obstruction, which is a blockage and you're vomiting, then you can't eat at all. And you might need intravenous fluid until the blockage uh, dissipates. But, but um, in terms of uh, ulcerative colitis, they actually studied this. They put people on, on, on strict IV feeding to see if intravenous feeding without oral feeding uh, made them better. And it did not in ulcerative colitis. In Crohn's disease, it's incredibly more complicated because there are diets that have been shown to induce remission in Crohn's disease, which are extremely difficult to do. And they do them in the pediatric patients where they actually put a tube feeding in, in, in a patient because the stuff doesn't, it's not palatable, it tastes terrible, I've tasted it, where they give you completely digested food into your small intestine, and that actually allows your bowel to rest and actually promotes healing and Crohn's disease. There are many um, or several, quote, Crohn's diets out there, Mediterranean diet, SCD diet, semi-elemental diet, um, and we actually have nutritionists that work with our patients uh, to figure out a diet that suits your lifestyle and may work for you. And, and sometimes I tell my patients, some of these diets are harder to follow than taking the medication because it involves cooking for yourself and restricting a lot of different foods. So, um, but there yeah, are our, diet our dietitians now. we have in our practice now are super helpful to work alongside us in helping manage right. symptoms. And like you were saying, you know, people could have IBS symptoms at the same time as IBD and, and right. working with them can kind of help guide that sort of uh, lifestyle management as well. I'm one um, of the, I'm one of the sort of fringe doctors who actually does not mind diets too much. I'm, I think <laughs> I'm a little wacky that way, but. Okay. Well, I think it's something you can control. And if it makes you physically feel better, it, it can do a right. lot. So right. um, people want to know about, I know you're not talking about specific therapies, but what are some of the new cool things that are coming out? Specifically, people are asking about fecal transplant, if that has any role. Is there any role for these, the stem cell therapy? I know this is very specific, but just give us a few snippets okay, so, of the exciting so, stuff that's coming out. Okay. So when I was a resident and a fellow, infliximab did not exist. <laughs> so all we had were steroids, mesalamine, and something called 6-MP methotrexate. And now we have different families of, so it's really interesting. This is what I explained to my patients. You're trying to go from New York City to Brooklyn, and you could take uh, many different subways, the bus, a helicopter, an airplane, the Williamsburg Bridge, the uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, all these different things are pathways that you can get to Brooklyn. So all these different things you can imagine are pathways of inflammation. And we're trying to block those pathways of inflammation. So we have these tumor necrosis factor drugs like Remicade, Humira. We have anti-trafficking uh, drugs like uh, Vetalizumab and a new one called Ozonamid, which prevents the trafficking of white blood cells. We have uh, IL-12-23 inhibitors like Ustekinumab or Stelara and Ricinicumumab, which is now gonna come out from ABV, which already treats rheumatoid arthritis. We have stem cell therapy, which didn't work when we gave it by vein, but may have benefit in perianal fistulas and injecting them into the fistulas. Fecal transplant, which is what I tell people, it's not ready for prime time yet, and it's not one fecal transplant. One fecal exactly. transplant does not cure ulcerative colitis. It's several, maybe several, and maybe from the right donor. 
So that's not ready for prime time. We're doing a study, as you know, we have a research protocol that we're going to do a study in a new oral agent that seems to have a lot of promise uh, in both Crohn's disease and also colitis. And um, hopefully <coughs> one of the days we won't just have treatment, but we'll have something that cures it instead of just controlling it. Yeah. And I, I like to describe to my patients, you know, you're lucky to have these diseases now rather than 50 years ago, because 50 years ago, we didn't, like you said, we didn't have infliximab. We didn't have any of these things and people died from this disease, you know, we had, we had nothing. And you had steroids, which would kill you when you're on it long enough anyway. So um, it, it can be scary to think about starting these medications, but they're, it's scary. It's much safer, like you said, than and they're safer. The alternatives. They're safer, yeah, right? they're safer yeah. than living with this they're, disease. These and diseases. they're safer than what we had. Exactly. Just because it's going in your vein or under your skin, that doesn't make it have more, more side effects. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Some of the exactly. pills have more side effects than some of the injections. Exactly. Um, let's see, maybe one or two more questions. Um, there were a few questions about COVID. Um, I would probably encourage people to watch Dr. Kornbluth's webinar specifically on COVID. Um, Thank you. Just because <laughs> he, he really is up to date with the latest stuff that's coming out. So um, check out our website for those webinars. He did a few during the past year with up-to-date information. Um, let's see what else. Um, people are asking I'll about- tell, I'll tell them this for COVID. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not at higher risk for getting COVID because you have inflammatory bowel disease. And the medications that we use that put you at higher risk for COVID are steroids, uh, immunomodulators like 6-MP and methotrexate and possibly Zelgians. But the other ones like Remicade. Yeah, the infusions Bionic, and injections we've been following and people aren't getting sicker on those. So not getting sicker on those. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else? People are asking about strictures. Um, how do you diagnose a stricture basically? So over time, over time, when you have this inflammation in your, especially Crohn's disease, because the inflammation goes deeper through the wall, the colon, the, the pipe, or the, the, I shouldn't say the colon, I should say the intestine, because it's more likely in the small bowel, the small intestine, the ileum, gets narrower and narrower. And fortunately, your body, when you digest food, most of it comes out liquid, and it doesn't solidify until it gets into the large intestine or colon. So even if you have narrowing or strictures in your intestine, most of the liquid gets through and gets digested until you reach the tipping point where it doesn't. And then you'll have a, an area that's narrow or strictured and sometimes food or vegetable material, especially or nuts or seeds, because sometimes we tell people they can't have these foods, will get stuck and give you a blockage or an obstruction and your belly will get swollen and distended. It'll make funny noises, like a trumpet's playing in your, bell, in your belly, and then you might have vomiting. And you might have that even without you know, nausea and vomiting and pain. And the best way to make the diagnosis of a stricture typically is using x-rays, MRI or CT, that will tell us how narrow the intestine is. And, and it'll also tell us if the intestine behind the narrowing is dilated like a balloon, suggesting it's a chronic stricture. And typically when that happens, uh, as I tell my patients, there ain't no medicine in the world that's gonna make this better. I don't care, you can take, you can, we can ship you all the biologic agent from wherever it's made, pump it into your vein, and it's not gonna work. Stop it. It's a, it's a scar. That <laughs> yeah. taken out. It's scar tissue. Scar Stop tissue, it. yeah. Right. See Wonderful. a lot of those. Um, well, everyone is saying how much of a rock star you are with this presentation and really appreciating the time my, you spent. Anything else my, uh, my you want to? <laughs> <laughs> Anything no. else you want to? Um, it's the most important thing. Mention on the way out. Yeah. Please see your doctor. Let them monitor you. Let them take care of you. Everybody means well, but, but you can have this condition. You don't, I mean, my patients are there. Some of my patients couldn't have children. Now they have twins. Now they have multiple children. 
We got them better. They're living normal lives. Uh, pregnancy issues, fertility issues, all these things, old patients, young patients, we deal with it. You need to be seen by somebody who knows how to treat inflammatory bowel disease, not your neighbor, not your friend, not your therapist. Um, close. I, I see. A, I see a lot of patients with who are pregnant with IBD or women being a female gastroenterologist. And one, my my um, spiel I always say is the best way to have a healthy pregnancy is to be in remission. So you have to continue to see your doctor, and we're never going to put you on medications that will hurt a pregnancy or hurt the baby. You know, seeing your doctor, don't stop your medicine. You know, stay on top of it. So you're in remission if you get pregnant, that sort of thing. So, um, but yes, we want you to live a normal, healthy, healthy life. You should be able to live to a ripe old age and do all the things you want to do. So there are football players in the NFL with inflammatory bowel disease. They're playing full contact sports. So yep. those days are over for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Thank you all for spending your Wednesday night with us. Um, if you would like to watch the uh, recording of this, it'll be posted onto our website in a few days. An easy way to get to our website is nygacares.com. That's our new easy way to get to the website. You'll see all our prior webinars under the news tab. Um, thank you again, Dr. George, and hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Mm -hmm.